Now? Yep. There. Okay. So this, this particular microphone has been an absolute nemesis to whoever is up here speaking as it starts to get crackle, crackle, and played with it a couple of times over the last week and no issues, and we were coming in today, I was talking to Nathan about it, and apparently we found out when our new soundboard got installed, what? that DirecTV is also on the same frequency. And so apparently around 4.15, 4.30, a lot of people around the Garland neighborhood are watching, uh, are using their dish. And so we will work on maybe changing the frequency or whatever. And so then tonight after service, we got, uh, we got Italian sodas. And because we're light on service, every single one of us will be able to two-fist it tonight. So there's something to look forward to here in a little bit. But tonight, we're going to be starting in a new series in James. And it's going to take us all the way through the entire epistle uh, of James. Now, James himself was one of the younger brothers of, of Jesus. Now, speaking of brothers, anyone here have an, have an older sibling? Some of us, actually quite a bit of us. I've got an older brother. I got a brother, uh, Travis, who's about two and a half years older uh, than I am. And like most siblings, we grew up, we, we, we were pretty close. We had a pretty close relationship growing up. Uh, we grew up in Moscow, Idaho, it's about an hour and a half southeast of here. Uh, but our actual home uh, actually sat, about, uh, sat a few miles outside the city limits in this tiny little neighborhood along Highway 8. And so for a lot of our summer days, we were home by ourselves. Uh, we, 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 didn't, we weren't able to get into town, so we had to really get uh, creative in how we spent our days together. So we would play with the other neighborhood kids, and we would, we would get our bikes out. We'd go riding up and down the streets and uh, organize maybe a, a game of uh, a football or baseball or kick the can or something like that. Behind our house was acres and acres of, of farmland, and so sometimes we would get a little mischievous, and we'd go... Uh, crawl over the electric fence, and uh, we would find these hay bales. And we said, well, let's make a fort out of these hay bales. And so we'd stack up the hay bales uh, and make a little fort out of them. Uh, we had a dog uh, growing up, a dog named Misty. She was a, a border collie, a purebred border collie. And uh, the nice thing about her, she was, as you can see, she was very calm. She let us do all sorts of things to her. She was a great dog. And our real board days, we would dress her up. I'm not sure what that was there, but we would dress her up. We love dress up. My mom was quite the seamstress as well, and in order to save money, she would always, she would make all of our Halloween costumes. And so here's my brother and I, and this is the problem with having an older brother. I never got to be Batman. I loved that costume. I never got to be Batman until he grew out of it, and then I became Batman. I made my friend become Robin. We would organize these carnival games in our backyard. We would we'd invite the entire neighborhood. We would charge them $2 to come in and participate in this, in this carnival thing. So we would, early in the morning, we'd go out to the driveway. We'd scrape a bunch of gravel up and, and spray paint it gold and then dump it into a bucket of water and say, hey, there's gold in the bucket. Why don't you go mine for it? It'll cost you $2. Part of the carnival, though, that Travis thought it would be fun to set up is a, uh, a, a softball throw. And we didn't have any, um, what are they, uh, bowling pins or milk bottles or anything like that. Uh, but what we did had, I had this little plastic football helmet I got, like a yard sale or something like that. And we had some very flimsy TV trays. And so we would go into the back patio and, and we would set up the TV trays. And Travis would, he would make me get behind the TV trays and put on my football helmet. And the neighborhood kids would pay to throw a softball at my head. Now, fortunately, they missed me most of the time and hit the house, but... So then we get older. 
we get older and our maturity levels begin to, to drift a little bit. So when we were young, we used to have these amazing Halloween parties. Every year we'd have these, these fantastic Halloween parties. Mom would decorate the house. She would decorate every single room of the house. Every room would have a different activity for all of our friends to go do. Uh, and then uh, there would be a, just a massive table, uh, including put the leaf in that table, massive table of fully sugary, heavy sugary delights. And then we get that done, all, all of us, my dad, my mom, my brother would go out to the garage and we would, we would turn the garage into this haunted house. And so at first, these were joint parties that we did. Travis uh, would invite his friends, I would invite my friends, and we'd have one party uh, together. But as he got older, um, he moved into junior high, his parties became at night, and mine were during the day. And so we converted the haunted house into a, a, a dance floor uh, for his. So he gets into junior high and he begins to take an interest in, in instead of parks and rec, starts doing school sports. And he was uh, hit, hit the weights pretty hard at that time too. So he's, he was a decent athlete. He was one of the top wrestlers in our town. Uh, really, at, an, at, a, at a young age, really began to, to bulk up. Me? Not so much. And so then out of high school, my brother, he joins the 75th Ranger Regiment and was stationed at the 1st Ranger Battalion over in Savannah, Georgia. Now, during this time with the Rangers, uh, Travis was able to successfully complete Ranger School. He became a jump master, became a pathfinder. He, attended, he, uh, he was able to attain the rank of sergeant in less than four years. And then in less than 10 years after enlisting with the Rangers, he applies for and was accepted into the Elite First Special Forces Operational Detachment, Delta. Now, as a member of Delta, Travis hunted the most notorious terrorists, and actually this particular picture here was in the mountains of Tora Bora when his unit was hunting bin Laden. He engaged in multiple combat missions, and he retired with multiple ribbons and medals, including the uh, Commendation Medal for the Army Commendation Medal and a Bronze Star. He, attended, he attained the rank of Sergeant First Class in just eight years, and was on, the, was on the, the list for consideration of Master Sergeant when he retired for the Army, all by the age of his, uh, he was in his mid-30s when he, when he left. And so today he owns and operates a very successful defense contracting company. Here we are at my wedding. He's got his, 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 his uniform on there. Uh, owns a, a very successful defense contracting company. So as a younger brother, how do you stack up to something like that? I mean, it's like, okay, so I got a nursing degree and I'm taller than he is. The role of the younger brother can be challenging. Can you imagine being the younger brother of Jesus? The conversations that you would have around the dinner table. So, so Jesus, what did you do today? Oh, gosh, let's see why. I, I healed a blind man and uh, I healed a leper. Um, I fed a few thousand people with just a couple of fish and a loaf of bread. That was pretty, that was pretty cool. Uh, oh, real neat. I raised someone from the dead. <laughs> wow. Well, that, that's fantastic. James, what about you, sweetheart? What'd you do today? Uh, help dad build the table. <laughs> and so here's Jesus. He's in the temple courts. He's conversing with rabbis as his young boy. He's turning water, and, and water into riot, wine, uh, raising people from the dead, curing various diseases. And on top of all this, he's the son of God. The Bible doesn't give us any real insights as to what Jesus' relationship was like with his brothers when he was younger and growing up with his siblings, but we do know that they did, his, his siblings did end up mocking him when, when, when they were all older. We read in John chapter 7, when John writes that the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, hey, you leave Galilee, go to Judea so that your disciples may see the works that you do, because no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. And since you, you're doing these things, you should go show yourself to the world. And for even his own brothers did not believe him. And so despite, two, despite all this, two of Jesus's brothers, they go on to write separate epistles. And one of the ones that we're going to be going through here tonight was James. James was Jesus's immediate younger brother. And so what changed? How does a man go from mocking his brother to being a believer in Jesus to becoming the head of the church in Jerusalem to ultimately being stoned to death because of his faith in Jesus? And my money would be to bet that he saw his brother rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. I'm pretty sure that would make a believer out of anyone. And so James becomes a believer. And evidently he becomes very influential among the new church uh, of believers in converting Jews. And according to the, to the theologian Clement of Alexandria, James was appointed by the apostles Peter and John to go ahead and lead the church in Jerusalem. 
And so at some point, probably in the late 40s, uh, he writes this letter that we now refer to as the Epistle of James. And, and so now the, the word epistle, we don't hear the word epistle very much these days. And so just so we're, that we're all on the same page, simply put, an epistle is a fancy word to describe a literary work in the form of a letter. And so James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, he's writing this letter. So who is he writing it to? We jump into James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And so the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Those eight words by, really form the foundation of why James is writing this letter. Because we see in the book of Acts, when we read the book of Acts, really what we're reading is the birth of Christianity. We're witnessing the birth of Christianity. Jesus has ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit came. The apostles begin their ministry of preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And with all this, the church saw explosive growth of thousands of people responding to the gospel. However, after a young man named Stephen was stoned to death, we're standing up to some religious leaders about his faith in Jesus. These new Christians in Jerusalem ended up being scattered. And as Luke records in, in chapter 8, or in, in Acts chapter 8, it says that on that day, the day that, that Stephen was murdered, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And so now you have these new believers, you have these, these new Christians that have been scattered throughout Israel. And now they're separated from the apostles, they're separated from the elders, they're separated from their teachers. And according to a number of theological scholars, this, the time that James was writing this letter, it was also before there were any missionaries, say Paul and Barnabas, had ever been sent out. They're on their own. These new converts find themselves more or less on their own, or maybe even in little pockets of community at best. And James knows, he knows the ups and the downs that they're going to be, that they're going to face, that they're going to have to navigate in learning this new way of life. And so he writes them a letter to encourage them and to direct them in, faith, in their faith. And at the same time, this letter, it is so rich in wisdom and guidance that we can apply it just as, our, just as much to our lives today. So to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. And then he jumps right into it. He says, consider it pure your joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now, if you've been attending City Church for any amount of time, or maybe you've been a part of small community, uh, you, you know that part of our DNA is that we, we, we're, just, we're very transparent. And so I'm going to be transparent here with you a little bit. Joy is not the first thing that comes to mind when I hit a bump in the road. And in fact, it's not the second, third, or even the fourth thing that comes to mind when I hit trials, when times get hard. I usually will land on a combination of fear and frustration, anger, anxiety, right out of the gate. So that's not to say I don't, that I, I don't eventually get there. I do. I do get to the joy part. But you see, joy is a choice. And James tells us that we can find joy in our trials because we know that growth and an increased intimacy with God is both in the midst of the trial, it's going to happen in both in the midst of the trial as well as on the other side of it. And so often people, we, we, we can intermix as, as, you know, happiness and joy as being one and the same, but they're not. Happiness centers on the earthly circumstances and how well things are going here right now, but joy centers on God and His presence in our experience. And so let me say that again, that joy centers on God and His, His presence in our experience. It's, it's so easy to feel alone in the midst of, of a storm, almost like you're, you're in, a, in a dinghy. You're stuck in a dinghy amongst these 50-foot waves crashing all around you. But the truth is, we are not alone. Despite how we feel, we need to land on the fact that in His faithfulness, God is with us. And so much like we discussed in the Elijah series, that we, we must, we must, we must, we must combat lies with truth. Because otherwise, the enemy will isolate us and he will destroy us. A small example is that there's, there's three different passages in the Bible, in Deuteronomy and Joshua and Hebrews, where the authors remind us of, the, of, of, of a very unescapable truth. It says, God will never leave you and he will never what? He will never forsake you. God is faithful. God is, is with you. 
James goes on to say, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. And so now that word perseverance, it shows up in a couple of different ways depending on the translation of the Bible that you are reading. It can read perseverance, it can read endurance, it can read patience. But depending on our outlook, we can use e each of those words can mean very different things and it's in, in the context and the definition. And so the correct, the, the correct context and definition is absolutely key to understanding this passage. It's so easy to look at this and say, well, you know, I just gotta, I just, I just need some patience. I gotta endure this. I just gotta white knuckle my way through this thing until it passes. And that is not what James is saying here. The literal, the literal definition of perseverance or endurance or patience, whatever translation you're reading, as James refers to here, it means that it is the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety, even in the greatest trials and sufferings. Oswald Chambers, I love Oswald Chambers. He wrote, suffering either gives me to, you, to, to myself or it destroys me. You cannot find or receive, your, receive yourself through success because you will lose your head over pride. And you cannot receive yourself through the monotony of your daily life because you will give in to complaining. The only way to be able to find yourself is in the fires of sorrow. And why it should be this way is it's immaterial. The fact is that it's true in the scriptures and it's true in human experience. I remember when Andrea and I, we went to Coeur d'Alene a couple of, couple of weeks ago, and we saw this caption. This is actually, John, the, the, the same sock store we found your socks. There's this caption on this pair of socks. It says, I love an easy challenge. Who doesn't love an easy challenge? I think we would all love to be able to walk through this life unscathed without the bumps and the bruises and the hurts and the cuts and the scars, but those things are going to happen, and it's how we choose to endure those trials that will determine which way our faith ultimately goes. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because I lost my place up there. I'm going back here. Uh, uh, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That, and that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. And so in June of 2015, our founding pastor, um, after a very long battle with burnout, um, ended up stepping down. And as a result of that, literally half our church disappeared. And, and, and our, our giving tanked as well. And I remember, so that was in June, and, and, and I remember in October... Uh, watching just kind of everything slowly fall apart and just walking out the doors one day and just, I'm going to go for a prayer walk and walking around the neighborhood. And I was coming back this way, coming down Providence, almost to Madison. And I was just feeling beyond discouraged. And I wasn't even really sure that we were going to survive as a church. And I remember as I came down Providence, just lamenting to God. And I was like, God, I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I remember clear as day, he said, just bring me in on the conversation. Bring me in on the conversation, Jason. You're worried about this and you're worried about that. You're wondering what to do as you're watching the numbers go down. Son, just bring me in on the conversation. And so again, going back to Oswald Chambers, he says, don't say that I will endure this until I can get away and pray. He says, pray now. Draw on the grace of God in your moment of need. Prayer is the most normal and useful thing. It is not simply a reflex action of your devotion to God. We are very slow to learn to draw on God's grace through prayer. And so wisdom is the key to know how to deal with a difficult situation. And God is faithful. He is so faithful. He will give generously and without reservation. But we must be willing to ask. And then when we ask, we must be willing to sit and listen. Wrap your face, as Pastor Caleb said many times during the Elijah series. Tune out the noise so that you can hear. Seek wise counsel as well. Whether it's an embarrassment or not wanting others to worry, you're just not feeling like you want to be a burden to others. We, so often when we go through trials, we go through stuff, we, we tend to isolate. And church, I think if COVID has taught us anything, we, it's taught us that Isolation is extremely toxic and it's extremely damaging to, no, to, to the mind, to the body, and to the soul. 
And so my encouragement is seek God's wisdom and don't, don't doubt that he will give it to you. Matthew in his gospel, he writes that if you then, though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You see, God is faithful in our trials. And so ask for his guidance, ask for his wisdom, in full faith that he will guide you, but be willing to listen, and then not only to listen, but to then move on what he says. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, and that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is of double mind and unstable in all that they do. Proverbs 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And so resist having a divided loyalty. Don't depend on God and then, okay, well, I'm not really sure I liked his answer, so I'm going to go ahead and then depend on myself. Lean not on your own understanding. Back to James, he says, believers in humble, in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position." But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers uh, the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich will fade even while they go about their business. And so continuing to discuss the joyfulness and trials, James begins to now direct his message to those who are in humble circumstances. He's addressing people, and he's starting to address a certain population here. And so during this time, there was, there, was, there was great value that was placed on being wealthy and the types of perks and attention and then, and then the favoritism uh, that one would receive because they have wealth. And the Greek word that James uses here when he describes those in, 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 in humble circumstances, he's talking about the poor. The insignificant in the world's eyes, it, it means that they are lowly that they are relatively poor and powerless, that they are lacking in material possessions. And so, again, the, the, the specific audience that James is addressing here is the Jewish converts that had been scattered. And because they were, they were Jews that converted to Christianity, they would have been detested by the Jews, persecuted by the Jews, who had not converted to Christianity. And oftentimes these new converts would have been disowned and cut off by their families because of their conversion. And on top of this, it was also a time of famine. And yet James, is, he, he addresses them first. He addresses the poor first. And he tells them, take pride in your high position. Because despite how the world sees you and despite how the world treats you, I'm telling you that God sees you and he honors you as his, as, as, as his own, despite your circumstances. And then James addresses the rich who are also being persecuted. And he tells them, you need to take pride in your humiliation. Because in a time of persecution, your wealth and your status, it's going to be stripped away. And while, hear me on this, it's absolutely in no way a sin to be wealthy, right? I think we can all acknowledge that. Wealth, but what wealth can do, not will, but it can create a barrier between us and God. And so James, in speaking to the rich, he's telling them not to find security. Don't find security in your earthly treasures because those treasures are going to pass away. They're going to go away like a wild flower scorched by the heat. They're going to be gone one day. And, and your only lasting security, our only lasting security for that matter, is a saving relationship with Jesus. So for those who find security and power in earthly treasures, you will be humbled. This is what he's telling them. You will be humbled, so take pride in that. And you will be made more equal to the poor in God's world. But James says to take pride in the fact that God is working to humble you because he is faithful, because God is faithful. And he desires above everything else, God desires us to be with him and like him. Verse 12 Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. 
blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. So the word trial, in its original translation here, it means an internal temptation to sin. So James is now shifting his attention from the outward trials that would, would build our faith and test our faith and strengthen our faith. He's now focusing on internal sinful temptations. And we probably all know this as well, but it, it, again, it, I think it's worth mentioning. Temptation is not a sin. It is not a sin to be tempted. Everyone faces temptation. Jesus faced temptation. It's not a sin, but rather it is acting upon that temptation, giving in to temptation, which is where sin is born. And God does not tempt us. It's crucial for us to remember that, that God tests us for good. He does not tempt us for evil. And so now God will allow these things to happen in our lives, but again, even in our temptation, God is faithful as well. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There is absolutely nothing unique about the temptations that we face today. They are common and every temptation that we face, every temptation we face, regardless of how strong that temptation is, God is what? God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will provide a way out every single time. So when we are tempted, we have to recognize that regardless of how strong this internal desire is that we're facing, there is always, 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 there is always a way out. And giving in to, tempt giving in to temptation, it is a choice. It is, sin is a choice. And so, real quick, with that, with, with, with this verse, people will often take it out of context and say, well, you know, God will never give you more than you can handle. And that is 100% false. God will never let you be tempted beyond what you can handle. But in regards to trials from the outside, I firmly believe that God will routinely give us more than what we can handle because it in turn, it, it creates a dependence and an intimacy with him. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And while I like the word, I like this word picture that, that, that James creates here of a person being dragged away, it gives a, uh, a sense almost of a... Uh, that, that, that a, a person's being dragged away. I, I just I kind of get this picture in my head of this person digging their fingernails into the floor and they're being dragged off by their feet and, and they're kicking and screaming and they don't want to go. They're going to this place that they don't want to go. But really, it's so much more subtle than that. In its original meaning, it says that we are being drawn out in the same way that a, that a hunter lures his game. We are lured away from the safety of our self-restraint. 1 Peter 5 says, Be alert and, and, and of sober mind, because your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So resist him and, standing, and stand firm in the faith. So now, how do lions hunt? If you've ever watched a, uh, um, a National Geographic or Planet Earth or, or something like that, you've seen it. Lions are quiet. They, they, they're hidden. They're observant, they are extremely patient, and they wait for an open opportunity to strike, to draw a weak prey out from the safety of their community. Of their community. What do they do? They isolate it. And James says that, that these inner desires that produce temptation, it's that, that, that temptation that comes from within. Well, how does that temptation even get in there? You know, the, the simple answer is, is Satan and his tactics and his tactics date all the way back to the original lie in the garden of, did God really say? And so with that, I want to I take an opportunity to challenge every one of us here to ask yourself, what exactly are you allowing to float in between your ears? What, what is it that you're looking at online or watching on TV? What are you listening to on the radio? Who do we allow to influence us? What inner desires are we allowing to take a hold of us. In his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Think about such things. 
Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put those things into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And so we are tempted and we are, we are lured away by our own inward desires and we are enticed. The original translation for that is, is lust. It is our lust for something that entices us. Our lust for something takes hold and then after that desire has conceived, after we have given ourselves over to it, it gives birth to sin. And so now we're, now we're at the point where we, we see sin to become dangerous to us. And the word conceived that, that James uses here refers metaphorically to a man indulging in his sexual desires with a woman. And so as you can see, the language that, that James uses to describe temptation is, is he talks about this specific trial. It's very intimate in nature. And looking through, the, looking through this lens, it begins to really craft the picture of how choosing to engage in sin is like engaging in infidelity. And therefore, it's, and therefore why we need to be so very aware of our actions. Now, I, I screw up pretty regularly at my house. Um, typically, it's the little things like Andrea will ask me to do something and, and, and I'll forget. I'll, I'll, I'll do it and I forget and she'll remind me later. And, or silly things like, well, there's one time years ago when she used to have a Facebook page. I, I hacked into her Facebook page and I told the world about what an amazing husband she has. Or I'll, I'll, she'll, she'll send me to the grocery store. Hey, can, you know, babe, can you go get... On lettuce or something for, for a salad for dinner tonight. And it's interesting because all the Safeways, whether it's North Point or Shadle or Northwest Boulevard, they're all a little bit different. I, I can never remember the, the layout of any one. And so I'll walk in, I'm going to go to the produce section, and I always end up walking past the bakery. And so I walk, you know, walking past the bakery, and the maple bar will catch my eye. And so I'll, I'll just grab a maple bar on the way to the produce section, and then I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll get everything, and I'll go, I'll go sit in the car, and I'll eat it real fast, because if I take too long at the grocery store, she'll know what's up, but I'll, I'll just, I'll have this maple bar, and then I go home, and here, here's the lettuce, and ultimately, guilt gets me, and I, and I tell him myself, and fortunately, nine times out of ten, Andrew is gracious, and the response that I get is, Mr. Krause, and it's very cute, but of course, okay, so she, she's forgiven me. And it's pretty lighthearted mess-ups, but, but what if it wasn't? What if I fell into a sexual relationship with another woman? It's no longer Mr. Krause respond. Well, it, it might be, but there's going to be a whole lot of words that follow that, right? Why? Well, for one, because on June 9th of 2001, we took a vow to one another to forsake all others. But beyond that, Sex involves the most intimate part of who we are and us giving that to someone else. And outside of the marriage covenant, it breaks that vow. So even, even if you're not married yet, you are still robbing the person that you will eventually marry of that level of intimacy that is strictly meant for them. And so if I step out, it means that I have willingly, right? It, it doesn't happen on accident. I'm not going to go walking down the street and fall over into some lady. Oh, oops, oh, well, that happened. That's not how that works. It's a choice. If I, if I step out, it means I have willingly chose to engage in an act that gives the most intimate piece of myself over to someone else. And essentially what it says is to Andrea, hey, uh, you know what? Despite all that we've shared together and, and then all that we've done and, and, and everything that we've said and promised, um, you just weren't important enough for me to uh, resist this opportunity in front of me. Now, for the record, I have never stepped out of my marriage. And so please understand I'm using myself an as an example to make that point. Um, I figured it was easier than randomly in inserting somebody's name here into the story, but I, I can certainly do that next time. Um, but each person is dragged away. Each person is dragged away by their own evil desire, and they are enticed. Each person is tempted when they, they let their guard down and then they are lured away by their own lustful desires. And then after desire has conceived and they have given themselves over to, uh, in an, an intimate fashion to their lust, it gives birth to sin. And when we give in to sin, and not just sexual sin, any sin, okay, any sin, when we give in to sin, God sees it as us giving away 
a piece of ourselves that we have as, as, as believers in Jesus Christ. He sees it as us giving away a piece of ourselves that we have promised to him. And so essentially, we're saying, hey, Jesus, despite what you did on the cross for me, and I, I really appreciate it, uh, it just wasn't important enough for me to resist this opportunity that was in front of me. We choose to give ourselves away. And after that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And again, church, temptation is not a sin. But when we act upon that temptation, when we give ourselves over to it, it will conceive into sin. And then there is absolutely zero protection in the form of any kind of a loophole on this. Regarding sin, Oswald, Oswald Chambers says this. He says, sin is a blatant mutiny against God, and either sin or God must die in my life. The New Testament brings us right down to this one issue. If sin rules in me, God's life in me will be killed. But if God rules in me, sin will be killed. Therefore, there, there is nothing more fundamental than that. And so when, when, when sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to death, and now it's come full circle. You've got desire, you've got sin, you've got death. There is, there, there is more, understand this, there is more to dealing with sin than just merely stopping. Now, fortunately, God in his grace and his goodness, his mercies, his love for us, he's, he's quick to forgive when we seek his forgiveness. But sin, it doesn't just hurt God, does it? Depending on what we've done or what we've said, and, and we're going to talk, uh, talk about the tongue, tongue lighting fires here in a few weeks, and I know I've personally said some, some very hurtful things to people over, over my years, even right up to this morning. Um, depending on what we've done or what we've said, the momentum of the chain of events may already be in motion, and like a freight train, it may take a very long time to stop despite the brakes being engaged, despite us withdrawing from that sinful behavior. Healing must come through repentance and forgiveness. And sometimes amends must be made because of the consequences of our actions or our words. And those things can result in very real collateral damage depending on the sin and who was in the blast zone at the time. Okay, so that was heavy, and I, I wanna, but I, I want us to feel the weight and understand the significance of what it means when we choose to give ourselves over to temptation, when we choose to step into sin. So let's finish with this. Let's, let's hit verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters, because every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of all he has created. So don't be deceived. Don't be, de don't be led into error about where God is in all of this. God is faithful, yes? A tactic of the devil is to speak lies and to speak deceit, and he is very, very good at it. And so if you're, if, if you're not going through something now, uh, most likely, uh, not most likely, most certainly, at some point you will. And the devil is going to try to get you to blame God for it. In John 15, and this is, this is Jesus speaking, he said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, what a glorious truth that is right there. I mean, Jesus, Jesus chose me. He appointed me that I might go and bear fruit for his name. Jesus chose you. He chose you and he appointed you that you might go and bear fruit for his name. You are a child of God. In his foreknowledge, God chose you. In his foreknowledge and all that I've done and all that I've said, he still chose me. In this world, as James has pointed out and Jesus said, you will have trouble. But take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. We're going to go through these trials. We're going to have these temptations. And so the question is, will we move on our own strength or will we give in to our own desires with the same crappy results? Or will we, will we choose to press into God? Will we choose to press into God who is always, always faithful? 
Where's Will? Will you come up? So Will's going to come up. He's going to close us out. And I look forward to seeing you all here next week as we conclude chapter 1 of James. Thanks, man. Thanks. Tough act to follow, but as I'm sitting here thinking about uh, this family in Christ that we have, I realize that, uh, that Jason is my much, much older brother. Uh, and, and as an older brother, that was a tough act to follow. And all I can think about is that only thing I got is I'm a little bit taller, and I got a nursing license. That's all I got. <laughs> um, <clears throat> joy in the midst of trials. Just random poll here. Uh, raise your hand if you've never, ever had a trial. Right? That's everybody. Okay. Raise your hand if when you face trial, your innate response is to thank, co- thank God for it and choose joy. Okay, that's what I expected. I'm not alone. So that means we all have things we can talk about and we can have unity over because we all experience trial. And what an opportunity we have, uh, double fist and Italian sodas, I guess, uh, to provide hope to each other because we know in this room there are people in the midst of trial. We know people that have just gotten out of it. And some of us are probably at some point headed back into it. Because God's refining us. So as we go on to prayer today, our ask is that when we're spending time together after service, we share these things with each other, that we're transparent, that we're vulnerable, and that we give each other hope. Father, I'm grateful for your character, Lord, that that you pursue us when we have lost value for ourselves, that you still chase after our hearts because our value isn't set by our trial or our circumstance, but by the perfected work on the cross and the design that you had for each and every one of us in our lives. So Father, let our conversations not only be glorifying of you, but providing hope for each other. And Lord, let us leave here more united, more connected, and more hopeful than when we came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.